defended for now. In it Hello guys and many thanks for tuning in as always. Now I'm more than privileged to say that I'm joined by former Berry Tranmere Rovers in Preston North End, Northampton Town and current Chesterfield fullback David Buchanan. Uh, hello David, firstly, many thanks for your right. time to speak to me today. It's great to catch up with you during these testing times that we're currently faced in lockdown. Um, I hope you're keeping well and keeping active. I am, I'm really well. So what sort of stuff have you been doing, obviously, to keep yourself fit? I see you're quite active on Instagram. You're big into your, into your health and keeping a healthy mind. Yeah, well, when I, when obviously when lockdown first started, we didn't know as footballers, we never knew really where, where we stood. And then mm. uh, the National League was the first to act, as everybody knows. And our season got cancelled before, you know, all the non-league, all the lower non-league clubs went first. And then, you know, it was a National League. and. Uh, recently, we've just in League Two now uh, this week cancelled. But when it first, when we first realised that we were getting cancelled, you know, when we sorry, when we never realised that we were getting cancelled, uh, we were just told that they were trying to start the season back up again. We had eight or nine games left; they were going to get finished. So, you know, you've got to keep yourself active. Uh, so I just started doing my usual things, what I'd uh, usually do in pre-season. Uh, we had some programs off the. Uh, sports science department at Chesterfield like every club but being experienced I sort of do my own stuff anyway uh, just things that I've picked up at different clubs working under different fitness coaches and uh, understanding what works best for my body so I just started doing my own stuff what I've done uh, going on to the I decided I came up with my own fitness regime and I decided that I'd have my working week the same as best I could so I'd use I'd have two sessions where I'd use pit sessions for an hour. I'd do an hour pit sessions, which would involve like short, sharp, intense running, box to boxes, uh, more football based. And then I'd use another three days of the week where I would do just road running or yeah. something like that. And I'd mix that up from a 5K and then a 10K. And then recently it's, 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 been where I've become addicted to be fair like people just think that because you're a footballer you can run and you know you should be fit yeah we are we are we are fit guys and you know we are athletes and I'm very professional always have been throughout my career uh, yeah it'd be interesting but, to see though when the season does come back which players have been keeping fit and which players which players haven't yeah I must say like it doesn't matter really in fairness you can keep yourself in shit for, for me mm. at my age I think the thing is for me is to just to keep my weight at the right weight and not be overweight, which I've done loads of times in my career, gone back overweight, which it's not good because it puts you behind. But uh, you can't replicate, as you probably heard this a million times, you can't replicate <laughs> match fitness. So it doesn't matter what you do in the off-season, you can do all the miles you want, which is going to stand you in good stead. It'll get you into pre-season. It'll make pre-season easier for you. That's why I yeah. try and do a lot because... Pre-season, no matter what you do, you're always going to come unstuck. There's always going to be days where you're fatigued and you just feel like you can't do anything because that's part and parcel of strengthening your body up, getting your muscles going again. And obviously, match fitness to just normal road running or pitch running or track running is just totally different. So with no live sport, it's been mentally a testing time for everyone, really. How would you assess the current campaign with Chesterfield finishing the season just above the relegation zone prior to the season being scrapped it's a bit of a frustrating finale isn't it the way it's all ended 
Yeah, it is. Uh, I must say, the last ten games, uh, we was on a great run. Uh, yeah. This is one of the things. Like, I, we we won a challenge for playoffs or anything like that. We had a poor season by our. We have mm. we were the book favourites to get promoted. So that tells you how, how much we underachieved as a as a group this year. Obviously, the the manager lost his job, and then uh, John Pemberton came in as caretaker manager. And the last ten games of the season. Before it finished, we was on a really good run. I think we were averaging one point eight points a game, and that was like top three or top four within the league. So we were finishing the season strong. We felt as though we'd we'd, we'd have comfortably been mid table, but you know hindsight's a wonderful thing. Uh, but as you say, it, it was tough. It was tough for me mentally. Uh, not only going to a new club where moving from Northampton, where I'd been for. I had four unbelievable seasons there, been captain yeah. club, but just the affiliation I had with that football club and the love I've still got for that football club, it was hard to leave. Uh, and when I went to Chesterfield, I got a bad injury after about seven or eight games. I fractured my tibia and I did a grade two on my medial. And that, in all my football career, that was the first time that I'd really picked up an injury. And that put me out for like 11 or 12 weeks. So... That was difficult, you know. It was the first time, as I say, I've been injured, and but Claire, the physio at Chesterfield, was different class. Uh, how she handled me, how she helped me through it, and she got me back fit. So it was hard, and it has been testing uh, my first year at Chesterfield. But you know, wherever football takes us in in the future, uh, I'm very optimistic because it's a massive club. It's got great people in it, and we've got a, we've got a great core group. You know, I think. We just need to start the season a lot better than we did. You know yourself from covering non-league games. Uh, it's the first time I've played in non-league and, and in the National League and it's there's no time for rest. The games are just very, very yeah. hectic. End to end. They seem like cup finals. It's weird. You, you're never out of a game or you never feel though you've got it won. It, you know, you can be two and look cruising and then the game just changed on its head. Where, you know, sometimes I think in the football league and the higher up the pyramid you go, there's times where you don't even concede a shot or you just have more possession of the ball and you control the game from start to finish. I found like this year that, you know, the game's a lot of turning each other's back fours, it's hectic, you cover a lot of distance, it's all high intensity, the ball the ball's in and out of play a lot, you know, there's a lot of set pieces. And we never started the season really well and and that affected us, I think, from there on in. Yeah, when you mentioned non-league and sort of never being out of a game, the first thing that the first match that came into my head was the Salford City versus Kidderminster, where they were four 0 down with ten minutes to go and managed to draw four all. That was that was an insane end to a game. Yeah, un- unbelievable. That's what I mean. <laughs> we've been a few of them this this season. Like I said, we started the season first couple of games. We were, I think we were leading in the first three or four games, and you know we end up getting chinned late on to like ninetieth minute goals. To one up in the first game against Dover, cruising should have been two and up, and then all of a sudden we conceded two within the last five minutes. And we've done that to teams as well in 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 the last ten games, and it just seems, as I say, that you can do that. And I think if you get, it's more important in that league to get to get the momentum going uh, from the start and the belief, and you know, and if you can, if you can do that, it's, it takes some stopping because you know Barrow showed that this season, Arrogant and teams like that. Only one team gets promoted automatically, so it's the hardest. It is the hardest league to get out. Yeah. So let's just take you back to where it all started for you, really, David. Obviously, joining the likes of Bolton Wanderers at a very young age, then on to Bury, uh, where where your career first took off. Really, spending five great years at Gig Lane. Obviously, yeah. you've seen managers come and go. You've worked with so many different players. A great set of lads, whoever you've worked with, and it is a family-like club, isn't it, Bury? Yeah, it's, it's it's just a tragedy what's happened to that football club, like just the history of it all, you know, the people of the town of Bury, you know, they've got no football club there now to go and support and uh, I've tried to work out hard, I've, I compete in the charity game along with mm. a few of the ex-players that I played with last year, you know, they tried arranging that again for this year, it went to be at Chester Stadium which I was going to be involved in again and obviously with the lockdown and stuff that, that hasn't materialised but you know, I just I hope that club can come back in some some way, shape, or form. Uh, I think it got that down. Obviously, not only by its owners. I think I think the whole 
foot, football let it down, you know. A club with that history, it's when the FA Cup should never, ever have gone out of business. But personally, I owe, I owe everything to that football club. I joined the 16, just been released, as you said, from Bolton Wonders. Uh, I went to Sheffield Wednesday, where I was going to sign for Sheffield Wednesday. But I went down there for a week and I was in digs and I always, <laughs> we were meant to play Arsenal away. I always remember it. And I just had this feeling where I'd never been away from home in Rochdale. Grew up on, you know, a council estate here. And I just had a feeling and I just didn't like it. And I always remember ringing my uncle and just saying, listen, come and pick me up. It's not for me. And Sheffield Wednesday, right. were massive. they are a massive club, but they were they were a big club then at the time. And he just came and he, you know, that's the type of family I have around me though. They never pushed anything. And I went down to Perry, uh, down to, to Gig Lane, as you say. And as soon as I walked through the door, it was not only was it next to home, you know, it weren't far away. I could get on a, I could get on one bus to Berry Bus Station from uh, where I live in Rochdale, and I could walk down to like the the stadium. So that helped me. But just the lads, they they seem to be all lads from my sort of backgrounds. You know, type of person I was growing up, and the coach at the time, Andy Feely, was an ex player. He was tough, uh, really tough. But just the group of players we had just were brilliant. And I set, as I say, I settled in really, really well in the youth team. And by the time I was 17, a year later, I was pushing pushing for the first team. Yeah, so obviously coming through the ranks at Berry, uh, just just when did it click for you that you knew you'd make it as a professional footballer? Obviously, we mentioned Bolton starting there, then joining Berry as a young kid. Uh, so where did, where did uh, your development start from joining Berry to... Obviously, he spent five great years at Gig Lane. I just think with every footballer, you know, it's about you've got to have self belief. Mm. You've got to have a certain character. You know, people develop quicker than others within the game. I, I've always been, you know, I've always been fat, small. Every, everywhere I went was a kid. Oh, you, you'd be too small to make it. That, that was always my setback. But I never took that as for an answer. I always made sure. No matter when people said to me that I couldn't do something, I always found a way to to make sure that I could do it or I adapted my game in a way that I could do it. Uh, and yeah, as I said, once I got my chance at Bury, and in terms of being a professional football, I just think everybody joins a game and once you go to an academy or back then a youth team and you're in that professional environment, you know, you believe you're going to make it. Every young player believe, or every young player should believe they're going to make it. But I just, I always remember Graham Barrow and Andy Priest, they were the managers at the time when I was in the youth team. And I remember them coming to the uh, youth team dressing room and just looking around, all of us are there, 20 odd players, and always sticks in my mind saying, like, in this dressing room, you'll be lucky if one or two of you's going to make it. You know, so the hard work starts now, that was on the first day. And that's always stuck with me ever since. Uh, even now at 34. Uh, I've played over 600 games and, you know, I've had I've had a really good career. But I'd never take for granted, you know, my next match, I'm, you're only as good as your last game and, and it's the biggest cliche in football, but it's true. In the off-season now, I just, I'm at a stage in my career where I just want to help the young lads develop. I want to help, mm. you know, the team be better. And when you're young, it's all about you, self, self, self. Bit, bit bitter if you're not, or you should be, but you're a bit bitter if you're not in the team and, you know, but, I think the older you get and when you've captained clubs and you've won things and you've been in successful dressing rooms and you've been in unsuccessful dressing rooms as well and had relegations, I think your full character as a, as a professional comes out. And for, for me now, I, I know how hard it is to compete against these young lads at 21, 22. So I, that's why I'm out now and trying to motivate all them in lockdown. As you said, you've seen my social media. I'm doing mm. a lot with in. I've always been a big community person. Anyone, if you speak to anybody at any football club, they'll always tell you that I'm massive about helping the community. Uh, any way you can motivate people, whether they're friends, family, or anything, whether it's a phone call, whether it's a text message. But with me being a with being, me being a professional, you know, ultimately, I can get her an exercise. And during lockdown, that's probably one of the only things we can do. So whether you can walk, jog, cycle, or run, you know, I'm just trying to get the positive message out there to go and do something. Don't let the negativity of the virus and don't let negative people get into your system and, and, and get you down. Try and stay positive. Te te 
take some positive out of it, wouldn't it? Maybe, you know, I'm missing football. I love football, but the positive is I'm getting time with my family that I've never, ever get. And I think a lot of footballers will tell you that, you know, you're getting time where you're usually away. You might, you have to train on Christmas. You have to go away Friday, mm. Saturday, and it's all your weekends and stuff. I'm, I'm using it as a positive. I'm getting time to spend with, with, with my nearest and dearest and I'm getting time to speak to people like you and develop myself as a person and, you know, educate myself and doing a lot more reading, as I say. Uh, but, yeah, from from the Bury situation, I, I owe them everything as a football club because they give me a chance to go and play professional. I took that chance and, as you say, I had five great years there to play us a couple of times, play with some fantastic players and our group, our group of players went on to have great careers. You know, Simon Whaley, David Nugent, Colin Kazin, Richards, Nicky Adams, Mark Pugh. That's just to name Tom Kennedy. These are just to name Dale Stevens, still playing in the Premier League. You know, mm. these are just a few of the people that that came through the system system with the likes of myself. So just goes to show that's why it's such a shame with all the what's gone on with the football club. You know, it's got that history of bringing players like myself who have gone on to have 15, 16 years careers. Nicky Adams is the same because we've played with. You know, it's no more now. It can't bring them players through, which is it's upsetting, really. I think as a young player as well, it's all about working hard to open those doors of opportunity and then grasping it when it does come. Uh, grasping yeah. opportunities is something that you did uh, when yeah. you were young. Obviously, you represented Northern Ireland at under 19 and under 21 level. That must have been a great experience, and I imagine you learned a great, um, a great deal in terms of your development coming through as a young player. That was one of the biggest, biggest highlights in my career. Obviously, my dad's Northern Irish, and yeah, now my wife's Northern Irish, and you know, so a lot of our family. That's probably the as well. That'll probably be the place where when I retire, I go back to live and stuff like that in Northern Ireland. Mm. Uh, but yeah, when I got the opportunity to represent. Northern Ireland for the first time, it was just mesmerising to be around that international setup. You know, uh, as a young kid, nineteen year old, I was up. The thing is, for me, I was probably when I was at Bury. At the time, I was, I was probably one of the lowest leagues in terms of like there was players from Man United, like Johnny Evans, is etc. And there was players from Man United, Tottenham Hotspur, so on, so on, Liverpool. Yeah. Uh, all Premier League clubs, but the difference was at the time is I was a 19 year old in the f in the first team, so by that time I'd already had a, a number of games under my belt. So when I went into that environment, I didn't feel phased. Where I think if I would have gone in there and still been a youth team player, I might have felt a bit less wanted or not as good. So when I arrived there, you know, I remember going to the Lillyshaw uh, when we had. We had a meeting where we had a few games just to get a look at like the squad and stuff. And I remember yeah. doing really well. I think I scored scored a couple of goals in the games down at Little Show. And then and then on a, I remember my first call up like it yesterday. Uh, we played Italy away in Rome and I scored the equaliser. We drew one all, which was a big result. I scored the equaliser away in Rome on my debut. So that's something I'll never forget. It must give you loads of confidence as well. Like, like you said, the names that are there and the clubs they're at. When you're at a lower league team and you're and you and you're playing alongside these players, it must give you confidence going into to a game with Barry, thinking I'm playing along the, the likes of these players oh, yeah, and, I, I, and I'm just I working hard to keep my place. Yeah, I think it definitely does. Uh, when you when you're younger, yeah. When I look back now and you've asked that question, it definitely did. And I think mm -hmm. if if the lads who have played international football, even in my career that I've played with, when I went like there was internationals throughout. For foreign players when I played up in Scotland, uh, all over. But you just get that feeling when they come back from international duty. You know they've got a spring in the step, as you say, uh, because not because they've been away at the environment. But you know, a lot of the lads who Aaron Pierre, for example, when he went away, say, and when I was at Northampton, he he went away like over to the Caribbean, and when you go over there, they're getting treated like heroes. You know, so when they come back, they're walking on water and they bring that into the dressing room, which sometimes when it can be, it can be very, very uplifting when, especially if your team's not, if your team's in struggling form and stuff like that, you know, uh, it's good. But 
yeah, to represent to anybody to represent the country it doesn't matter who it is. It's just it's the biggest achievement you can have as a, as a professional footballer. I mean, there's so many players out there that have never represented the country at any level. So you can you can look back on that and like, no, like yeah, say you, sc- you scoring your debut as well. I got 22 caps, I think, in the end. Mm. Uh, I got I think nine for the under 19s. I played in the European Cup as well. The under 19s, uh, England beat France in the final actually. So I played in the under 19s European Championships, and I think I got 13 for the 21s. Uh, now, just now, just touching on Barry again. Obviously, it's such a sad situation with what happened, and especially the fans. There's such a close connection there with the fans in the football club. And when the news did come out that they were going into liquidation, the, the, there was loads of press outside giggling every every hour of every day. It seemed with supporters that were upset. Um, but I, I feel for Nicky Adams as a player who's been there three times. It must be so gut wrenching because he was he didn't want to leave Barry at all. But he was yeah. sort of he had no real option than other to uh, return to Northampton, a club which he'd also previously played for. Yeah, all them players, you know. Mm. Ryan Law, the manager, you know, my yeah. my best my best friend Stephen Dawson, he was there as well. Uh, we played together. He that was the second time he went back. But you know, he had another year. They got robbed of. Not only did they get robbed of the jobs and the livelihoods, you know, they they stopped getting paid and they got robbed of the yeah. football club, but. They got robbed of a chance to to stay together as a group and go and play play in League One together, you know. And luckily for Nicky, because you know he's he's been so good. Well, he's the best. For me, I always say in every interview that I get asked, he's the best League Two player ever, Nicky Adams. No matter what anyone says, it, they would never have a vote on it. But if they could have a vote on, like who's the best Premier League player ever, they have a vote on it all the time. It, you get the same names that come out of it, Henri, whoever, Rooney, whoever it is, Ronaldo. If they could do one on League Two, Nicky Adams is the best player. He'd win it hands he'd win it hands down, you know. And look at him again at Northampton gone back there, the and they've ended up finishing in, in the playoffs. Again this year. He's a, a fantastic box to box. I remember the game with um before he left Berry, I remember the game with Lincoln when Lincoln won the league and they drew three all at Gig Lane. It was a fantastic game to watch. And Nicky yeah. was absolutely fantastic. Like you say, he's been there three times, and it's not like it's not like he's dipped in form in any of those three di- different occasions that he's played for football. He's con- consistently been up there year after year. He's not only a class player, but he's got a great understanding of the game, you know. And the order he's got as well, the mature he's got, and he's a leader. You know, he's club captain there at Northampton. He was captain at Bury as well, you know. So he's brilliant in the dressing room. Not only is he a funny lad, but you know. He leads by example. He does lead by example as well. Uh, but ultimately, on a Saturday afternoon or on a match day, you know, he knows his job inside out, uh, and he gets paid to provide goals. And he finishes top of the assists charts every single year. So that's why he keeps getting clubs and keeps getting good contracts. So yourself and Nicky had a great relationship. Obviously, you played with each other at Berry and Northampton together. Yeah. Uh, you must have some stories uh, to share with us uh, down the years. Stories? I've got millions. <laughs> depends, <laughs> what, depends what stories you want. We've done, some, we've done a lot of things together, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I don't think there's... There's, <laughs> there's enough time. Can't for the cameras and all that, but... <laughs> no, but we, for me, it's just more... I don't know what stories you want to hear, but like we've done ev- everything you can do together, we've done together. You know, we've we've won promotions together, we've lived together, we've mm. been on nights out together, been away together. You know, we've done it. We've done it. We've done everything with each other. Uh, but yeah, to be fair though, the thing is, away from football, we don't really we speak to each other, but we're not really friends. You know, mm. we are, we we're, we're, we're close friends, but what I mean is we. He lives in Bolton, I live in Rochdale, I've yeah. got my community friends, he's got his area friends, but we always keep in contact with each other and, and stuff like that. I've, you know, I think two people, me and Nicky, if you asked him the same, we've, he's not more, I don't think there's anyone in the game I've got more respect for than him. You've made a lot of close relationships really with Berry and Northampton especially, you've uh, like a few players you've already mentioned there, it's it's they they are both similar in terms of dressing rooms where the the players are so close together and there's a there's a tight bond there within within the group. 
yeah, I think that's massively important if you want to be successful in football. You know, you don't have to be the best team and the best group of players, but if you've got the best team spirit and the best camaraderie, and you know, you do, you, you, you're the best team off the pitch as well. It goes a long way because what it does is whether it was when I was at Preston when we got promoted to the Championship, whether we won the when we won the league with Northampton. The aim was on the training ground. We we trained and we worked like monsters. You know, it was competitive every single day. There was someone on it. If you know, there'd be tear ups, people grabbing each other by the throat. If you if but if you lost if you lost, you played a five aside game for example, and you lost. There was always someone on it. You'd be doing the team that lost would be doing running or whatever. So nobody ever wanted to lose. But ultimately, them groups of like I said, the Preston group when they got promoted and the Northampton group. Whether you was in the team or whether you was in the stands, you weren't even on the bench. Everybody wanted you to win. And that's yeah. the difference between successful teams. You wear it all the time. How does Mourinho, how does Pep Guardiola, how do these top managers keep these superstars, multi-millionaires on two and three hundred grand a week when they're not even playing, how do they keep them happy? And that's why they're the best managers. Obviously, they're the best coaches and they've got the best knowledge and they're working with the best players. But... The managers like Chris Wilder, for example, now look what he's done at Sheffield United. When we was when we won the league with Northampton, him and Alan Mill and his group of staff and our players, that's what they were brilliant at. Man managing people and keeping the whole dressing room on side. And as I say, if you wasn't playing, you wasn't happy and you go and see him because that's part and parcel of your job. If you're not if you're not being allowed to do your job, then you've got every right to be upset. But there was no falling out. Once you got told why you weren't playing, if you agreed with it or not. Come match day, it doesn't matter. You wanted the guy in your position ultimately to have the game play well because you wanted the team to win. So then from Berry, you obviously made the move up to Scotland after five year, great years at Berry. It's fair, so you must have that. Um, you moved up to Scotland to play for Hamilton. Just, just how was that? How different was that to playing um, after five years in English football? It was difficult because I never wanted to leave Berry. Mm. Uh, we had a big fault. Like we, had, I had a fault. Like. Uh, got offered a two-year contract like in the January time, uh, and I wanted to stay there because it's all I ever knew. I was doing well. I, I I was in the team every single week, and you know, it came down to the contract that I was on at the time. I just felt as though I'd earned a better deal, but because I come through the youth team, which happened a lot, I never got offered what I did. I was. I felt I deserved, you know, there were players in that dressing room or people coming into the club that was on a lot more money than me and on a better contract. And I was holding out for what I deserved. Ultimately, that never materialised. And, you know, I end up going up playing the SPL. But again, things happen for a reason in your life. And when I look back, that was one of the best things that could have ever happened to me. Massive disappointment from leaving the club that gave me a chance. And I, I gave my everything for I love playing. I love playing for the club. It helped me grow up as a person. Uh, but when I moved to Scotland for that year to play in another league, and like it was a Scottish Premier League, and just to see a different style of football, different culture. Uh, looking at it now from like as I know, done my degree from a media perspective. Uh, it's massive. It's their Premier League, so they get the same coverage as like the Premier League lads would down in England. You know. And the standard in Scotland is very good. When I was up there, they all, I always used to say to them, lads, they used to think League 1 and League 2 was rubbish. <laughs> or sh shite, as they say. But uh, it's not. The standard is very good. And it's the same down here. You hear a lot of people say, oh, Scotland, pub leagues, or whatever it is. But it's not. There's some very good players in Scotland and a lot of good football gets played and but going up there, just do all experience. And, you know, obviously to go and play at Rangers and Celtic as well, two of the biggest teams in, in in world football, really, in terms of fan base and what they've won and stuff like that, was another, you know, something that I look back on and think, yeah, well, I've done that. I've played at Parkhead in front of 50,000. And it was good. Played against some fantastic, as you say, international players as well, playing for them teams. It sounds like an old cliche, but when one door closes and another one opens, and that everything does happen for a reason. Uh, I was speaking to Glenn Hurst, a good friend of yours, a couple of weeks ago, and he was saying 
up in Scotland. They absolutely adore the players. The fans are, are so hooked on football. Even if you bumped into a Hamilton fan now, they'd soon recognise you. And Oh, yeah, all the time. And, uh, we, we, and start we, we, chatting. Yeah, 100%. That's what I mean. They live and breathe football. You know, mm. this, the, it's different. It's weird. Like, like I said, the atmospheres up there, yeah, they're unbelievable. Like, I went and watched Rangers against Celtic in an old firm derby. And, like, phew, I've been to Anfield, I've been, you know, in big games, but there's no game that I've been to like that. The, the stadium actually moves from underneath you <laughs> for 90 minutes. It's bouncing. You know, the, the, they're so passionate about about the game. And, you know, as I say, it was a fantastic experience, experience for me. And, you know, one that I don't regret. Like you say, that door opened for me and I, I, took, I took my opportunity and I enjoyed ev every minute of it, really, even though it only lasted for a year. So after spending a year up in Scotland, you returned to the northwest of England to join Tranmere Rovers in, a, in an action-packed season, playing in 41 matches for the club in that season. That's a lot of game time. must have taken its, its toll physically on you after, obviously, playing in Scotland the previous year. Yeah. The, the thing is, with the Tranmere situation, that was the most difficult time for me as mm. off the field and pitch in terms of we went to Scotland and we moved up to Scotland with my wife and kids at the time. And when all that went through, obviously I was going back down to England, but I never had, it weren't as, I went to Leighton Orient where my friend Dawes was captain, Russell Slade was a manager, and I went uh, to pre-season there uh, with them. Uh, but they, they weren't offering anything. It was just brilliant of Russ to, to let me go and train with them, really. I knew that I weren't getting anything. They had Charlie Daniels at the time playing for me. You know, has gone on to have a fantastic career himself. Uh, but... Yeah, when I went up to Tranmere, Les Parry was a manager at the time. Great guy, Les. Top draw. Uh, but Tranmere, I went on trial. And this is what I said to a lot of people. A lot of people won't go on trial. I weren't one of them. I went on trial there. And to go on trial as a footballer when you've played as many games as I did, I'd been well over 200 by then, well over in, 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 in my career, you know, you feel as though you shouldn't have to go on trial, but it's just what you have to do. Uh, but when I signed for Tranmere, it was difficult because I got a terrible contract uh, when I was there. So my missus and kids had to move back to Northern Ireland and I actually moved back in with my nan. So I was living at my nan. So I was living away from my family. But, you know, it's that's the way it is. It, it motivated me to say, well, I'll get myself in the team. I'll make sure I have a good season and I'll get the rewards at the end of it. And ultimately I did. Not everybody knows the story behind that. My missus and my kids had to move away from me. I and mean, that's what the sacrifice that I had to make in terms of my career. Uh, but I did. And I went on to play 41 games. And if if you check the thing, I, I, I actually won two player of the seasons that year and I won goal of the season. So, as you say, if you believe in fate, like like myself, and you believe that if you work hard and everything happens for a reason, then that just goes to show you that everything does happen. Because I sacrificed living away from my wife and kids and end up getting player of the season. So would it be fair to say that it reignited your career joining Tromia? You're obviously playing so many games, uh, those accolades that you mentioned, obviously after leaving Bury, spending a year in Scotland, it really did kick off your career once again after life after Bury. I think it did, you know, and Ronnie, Ronnie Moore was the manager when, when I left Tranmere and I want, I, this is the thing again, I end up, Tranmere fans end up falling out with me, I think a little bit because I signed there for a year, they, they, but they don't know your story behind, before you mm. sign and all that and what sort of contract you're on and stuff like that, they just see you as, you're a player, but it doesn't matter, your contract doesn't come into it, once you sign a contract with a football club, whether the highest paid or whether you're the lowest paid, you, your output to the team and for the team should be the same. That's the way, that's my mentality. Uh, but at the end of the season, I was in his office and I said to him, I wanted to, he wanted to sign me. And I said, yep, yeah, I want a two year deal. You know what sort of deal that I've been on this year, you know, and I won't, won't, I just want what everyone else is getting. I want rewarding for what I've done this year. 
you know, I've ended up being playing a season, I've ended up playing 40 odd games and that rate. So I, I went away, I went on holiday, I went back to Northern Ireland and we were negotiating the contracts as you do as players. When you get a contract, you get 28 days to sign it. So once it's in writing, you've got 28 days to decide what you're doing. And uh, we were back and forward and they ultimately weren't giving me what I wanted. And then I got a phone call off Preston to say, will you come and have a look at the ground and will you come and have a look and speak to us? So that's what I did. And to be fair, I'll be brutally honest, once I turned up at Deepdale and walked around the stadium, there was only one place I wanted to be, you know, because like you saying there about the season, what I'd had before and where I'd been, I knew that this was the time for me to kick on in my career and this club would give me the opportunity to get to where I need to be. You must have been so confident after that great season at Tranmere, joining a club like Preston North End, a fantastic club, a great stadium, uh, great supporters. Um, you had some great years at Preston. Obviously, you formed a great relationship with Graham Wesley down the years. I imagine you've got a story or two about Graham as well. I've got some Preston right. North End's band there. Right. Yeah. If I, I could be here now until tomorrow morning, <laughs> the story, but I don't want his solicitor giving me a ring, so we'll leave. We'll leave <laughs> I mentioned there about the um, the strength of the squad at Preston. Just how was the competition for the left back position with Scott Laird, who obviously yeah, was Laird, the best players that you played with at Deep Delta at that time. Yeah, Laird, Laird is one of the <laughs> Laird is a fan. What a player! Great player, but just a great guy. But the difference was with me when I arrived there, which I didn't mind, was Lady was one of West Graham's Graham's boys to be to be fair. He'd done unbelievable for me at Stevenage. They'd won numerous promotions, numerous league titles and you know, he was class. Uh, all the lads who came from Stevenage, Joe Byron, John Massino, you know, they'd been with and if a man no disrespect, if a manager brings you to a football club, he knows what you're about and he obviously rates you and obviously wants you at that football club to take you from one club to another so when i arrived there i i was under no illusions that Luke lady was like one of the main men within his squad so it was going to be tough to to get in the team so you know i just knuckled down the same i trained hard every day uh, but there were some times where i felt i should have been playing in front of him but i weren't and I made no bones about going senior and telling him about that. You know, if you if I felt I was should have been in the team and I wasn't, then I'd be the first to go and knock on the manager's doors. I don't hold back. I'm I'm an honest guy. I'll, I'll tell people what I think. Uh, over my career, that's at times that's not helped me uh, because sometimes you just need to keep your mouth shut. But the way I've been brought up myself is you know it's better in the now if you bottle things up and don't get it off your chest you know ultimately you end up taking it home then to your to your family uh but as i said I had nothing against lady i just kept my head down if i weren't in the team i just kept training away training away and i knew it'd become a time as a player you just know when a time's up for a manager the fans had turned on uh graham and he thought I was a bit of a problem in the dressing room, which I wasn't at all. I've never been a problem in any dressing room. But ultimately, he lost his job anyway. And as soon as Simon Grayson came in, then playing myself in the team, I played I played most of my football then. I think I played every, the last 20-odd games of the season. Simon Grayson came in. And then the season after, we obviously got to the playoffs. Semi-final got beat off Rotherham. And then the season after that, we went and got promoted. So the championship, although I didn't didn't play in in the final at Wembley, I got injured in the January and couldn't get back in the team. The lads were that good, just couldn't get nowhere near nowhere near the team in the end. But Preston was unbelievable football club on and off the pitch. I, I've got nothing but good things to say about it. The people there, the staff, I loved it. I f it was the Preston was the one football club that I felt like when you turn up to work, like you feel like I'm a player. You know, mm -hmm. everything was there, like laid on for you, breakfast in the morning, training grounds immaculate, top facilities. As you said, turning up to a match there when you've got your club suit on and you're going to warm up and 
you know, there's 12, 13, 15,000 in the stadium, fans behind you. Great tradition. So Tom Finney, God rest him, you know, a legend of the English games there at the games. And anyone, like even now, they're doing unbelievable, but it's just another football club that, you know, I really loved and I didn't didn't really play. If you think about my time at Northampton, I know we're going to go on to it, but in terms of pressing, I didn't play as many games as, you know, I felt I should have done and could have done. Uh, but fan, unbelievable. I had an unbelievable time there. As I say, I got great mates there, got to a playoff semi-final and then obviously got promoted to the championship. Ultimately, I got released in the end, which was a bit disappointing, but one of them ultimate things in it, one door closes, another one opens, end up joining the club, which now is in my heart more than any of them. Obviously, you've had different managers over the years. Managers do come and go. Uh, it can sometimes deflate a dressing room or it can have a positive effect. You've played under a lot of managers, as I say, and have you, obviously, Preston, you mentioned there that you, um, you played, obviously, Simon Grayson came in, a great manager. I know a lot of players that have got a lot of respect for Simon Grayson and what he's done. He's been in some great job roles. Uh, just, just how was life under under Simon? Simon were brilliant. You know, Simon's just a brilliant guy. He had brilliant staff. Glenn Snodden, who I worked with again at Chesterfield, just uh, always on the training ground, took all the sessions himself, you know. And he was another one who just built a, a group of players like a great mix, not only good players, but a great mix of characters. You know, people that got on really well, people that wanted to compete with each other and challenge each other every day, uh, no matter what it were doing. And that's what Preston were like. Honestly, if you if you were doing a running session, it was like who, everyone wanted to win it. If you were doing lifting weights, it was in the morning. Right, we had 100 club, who, who can do this, who can do that? You know, head tennis was going on all the time. Uh, People doing free kit, everything. That's what I mean. There's just a competitiveness of that of that group, and the talent within it was was really really high. Uh, but Simon was good, you know. As I say, he he knew he just knows the game inside out, and you know, and he knew how to get the best out of that group. So in 2015, after leaving Preston, you made the decision to move south of the border to join Northampton Town, a really successful period in your career, especially playing under Chris Wilder, as you mentioned before, winning League Two in your first season there. Just how was Chris as a manager? Uh, we all know what he's gone on to achieve with Sheffield United since uh, fifth in the Premier League up to up to the uh, coronavirus stopping yeah, Chris, it. Chris and Alan together are just top draw. I, as, I, as, as people know when I'm at Bury, there was the other way around at Bury. Alan was the manager and Chris was the assistant manager. And then Chris went to Oxford. Mm. Uh, but obviously, when I rejoined them, it was the other way around, which is better because Alan's an unbelievable football man. Uh, tri- on the training ground, like coach wise, and brilliant. Just comes up with things that you've never could think possibly work, and they will set pieces and where they want to play and stuff. But yeah, them two together were just class. You know, Chris was. Chris is brilliant at that. One day, he'd be all over you. How's your missus? How's this? How's that? What do you do at the weekend? You work for a beer, this, that, and the other. And then the next time, it'd be like, he'd just walk past you and wouldn't say a word. And you think, yeah. <laughs> Have I done something wrong? What's wrong with a gaffer? And everyone would be like, gaffer's not it. Like, you know, didn't always come up to the training ground and, and things like that. But when he was on there, his demands on the group, didn't matter if you were the skipper, if you were the oldest player, the youngest player, the best player. If you deserved a bollocking, you were getting one. If mm-hmm. if you didn't think you should play, you wouldn't play. You know, if you didn't think it was the right game for you, even though you'd scored a hat trick the week before, you wouldn't play. And he was just brilliant. Ultimately, he was brilliant. Not only is he a good man manager, and you know, the pair of them together have just they've got what it takes, and it obviously shows that they've been put. He's been promoted out of every single league. And, you know, if the season wouldn't have ended, who knows where they might finish Sheffield United. I imagine that you got on really well with Chris because he's much like yourself in the sense that he says it as it is. If he's got a problem, he'll tell you. And that's yeah. just that's his what, attitude. What, what away from it is a great man that's manager. With... That, that's a big thing, factor for me, what I love about him still to now. 
You know, it's just a breath of fresh air to hear somebody that just so plainly honest, you know, because it's not one of the big two or three managers saying it, but everyone respects him, you know. But you, at the end of the day, we're in an industry where everybody loves it and it's a business, but we're human beings. We've all got feelings and we're all entitled to our opinions, you know, and, we, and ultimately we'll say things that people don't like, but don't do it to, to be any harm. It's just... If I say something to you, it's what I'm feeling, you know. And yeah. If it offends you, then tough shit, you know, because I don't mean to, I don't mean to do that, or he don't mean to do that. He's just basically being as as honest as you can be. It's refreshing to see managers like. That. I remember Big Sam back in the day being being very similar in the sense that if if he doesn't like a manager, he'll, he'll tell them straight. He'll tell them how it is. Yeah, of course you got to be like that, aren't you? You know. If, and then people have been successful doing it, you know, mm. so it shows that it works. So why why change the person who you are, you know? We're, our lives are all individual. As I say, our football careers are all individual. So, you know, don't always go with the flow, always go with the flow, you know? So with, so with Bury and Northampton, is it fair to say that the, the dressing rooms are very similar in terms of the togetherness of the lads and, and the way you all get on. Very dressing room at the time because I was a bit younger was was different because yeah. because I, I was a younger player in the Bury dressing room looking up to the likes of you know David Flitcross, Brian Barry Murphy's, Andy Bishop was like main main players back then. Uh, people like that, David Challoner, Colin Woodthorpe, who obviously played in my position, who got un, unbelievable respect for Chris Beach. Like these were all. I was a younger player coming through, mm. so. I didn't see it the same way as I did when I was at Northampton, where I was as like a senior player, you know, a captain within the dressing room. But, and when I was at Northampton, it was different because I lived with like me, three of the other lads. So me, Nicky Adams, Joe Byron and Ricky Holmes, we all lived together. So wow. we was, Joe's jo from uh, Accrington where, so we like, right. travel, we have a lived together when we're in Northampton and we stayed down there. So it, the dressing room there was totally different in terms of that. There was a few. There was a few of the players that also was up from this way: Jason Taylor, Ryan Creswell. Uh, so they lived together as well. So when we finished training and stuff at Northampton, we used to go to like for coffees together, for Nando's together, for meals together, for people round each other's house. So we was cinema together. We was always in each other's pockets, if you know what I mean. So. The, we were that was that was the tightest group that I that I have been involved in, definitely that for that one season, especially like that group was unbelievably tight. I mentioned about confidence earlier about when you was at Tranmere and you played forty one games in that season. Now that first season at Northampton, everything just clicked and it? it was a fantastic season to be involved in. Yeah, but the thing the thing is it did click, but the club nearly went under, you know, at the start mm. of the season. You know, we were the same. We didn't get paid. The, the players, the staff, everybody within the football club never got paid for 10 weeks. And uh, there's obviously a famous, when when the gaffer, when Chris Wilder came out and did the famous slight speech, which now at, not after the game at Knox County about his thoughts and again, being honest the way he is. Yeah. You know, that just changed everything uh, for us. And, I think that helped us that season massively. We, we were a talented group and we were all together, but in times of need, a bit like the Bury situation, when you're in times of need, the fans are always with you. And the fans down there are, are brilliant. Like, you know, it only holds seven and a half, eight thousand uh, at six fields, but when you're going well, they'll pack it out week in, week out. Uh, they'll, they'll come and support you. But that season, like, even when we were behind in games, they really rallied us and really lifted us. And the affiliation and connection between supporters and the players was unprecedented, really. And we just, in the end, we became unstoppable. It felt like that as a player. It just felt like we were, we were going to win every single game, whether we were in front, whether we were behind. You know, we just felt like one of the players, Ricky Holmes, usually had come up with something out of nothing. And it'd be a wonder goal. Or I remember us being two 0 down against Northwich Victoria at the time in the FA Cup after 
35 minutes and we ended up scoring three late goals. And we did that loads of times. You know, the best one of the best feelings I had ever had is we were saying, I think the, the time we knew we'd won the league, we played Stevenage away. Again, we were 2 0 down that game. You know, and they've been giving us loads of stick, uh, their supports and stuff. And then once we got one, half time, we just knew it's coming. It's coming. We'll win this. Just, just don't concede another. We'll win it. And then again, Ricky came up with one right at the death, in off the post. And I've never seen scenes like that. To be fair, to be involved in was just different class. And uh, yeah, that's when we knew we won the league. But yeah, that season, the connect because of the start we had to it, and we never knew that they thought they were going to lose the football club with supporters. Just a story behind that from the start to then go like. We broke all sorts of records as well along the way, uh, being unbeaten runs and stuff like that within within the football club. And just brilliant. It felt better. That was my biggest achievement because I, I played such a big part in it and we'd won the league. It was the first time I'd won a league. So coming from Rochdale, David, obviously playing in the northwest of England for so long for the clubs that we've been through there. Do you think you found a, a second home in Northampton, spending a lot oh, yeah, of great years there? and? Having a great connection with the fans down there as well. 100%. Uh, yeah, definitely. I think because what I've done, just just the roller, just the roller coaster ride I've had with that football club, the amount of games that I played for it, the stuff I've done on and off the pitch, you know, for the club, for the community, and the affiliation I've got with the fans. I've got lifelong friends down there now, my business partners there, like, I've got, like, as I said, Friend, people down there that are like my family, so I never wanted to leave. I would have, I would have finished my career there. And not if I could have done, no, no problem. Uh, and it is good, no matter what anybody says. You play football to to just win matches and get three points and, and win titles and hungry for promotions and that. But when you leave a place now and you still got the connections with the supporters that I have and you get named in like the, the best team ever and stuff like that, you know, it makes you feel good because it shows that you're appreciated for doing your job to the best of your ability. And that the thing is about me, Tim, is I've been one of them. There's been people throughout my career that have had more talent on the little tour than I ever had. But the one thing that anyone will tell you about me is I will do everything I can to to win first and foremost, but I work hard. I used I used to be obsessed with that pressing, as you say, with a lady situation, just because I felt like that Wesley was always going to pick him or whatever it was. So when we get the stats on every day, I'd be making sure that he never outran me, never outtrained me, never outbeat me. <laughs> and I was just one of them people, and I still am one of them people. As I said, I, like, like now I'm doing loads of... I'm doing... At the minute, I'm doing loads of challenges with different people. My, my old assistant manager challenged me to a 13-mile, it's a youth team manager out in Northampton, he challenged me to a 30-mile right. marathon race a couple of weeks ago. So we did that to raise money for the NHS. Now he wants to do a marathon, but we did it to raise money for the NHS. Uh, yeah. So uh, we raised a lot of money for them. But then since then, I have people that I don't know from my force like saying to me, oh, you know, you're inspiring me going out, what can I do? So I'm helping them do running. And then there's been other challenges through Stephen Darby and Chris Rimmer have got MND and doing like 100k in May. So I'm doing that with a lot of my close friends from Rochdale. So I found myself now that I'm out and like last month alone, I ran 271 miles. Uh, and then this month, I think I've done 165.5 so far. So this is what I mean, even so like 34, I'm being positive and trying to keep people positive, but there's a message behind it to everybody is that even for players at Chesterfield now, a club that I'll give my all for, because that's just me. When I sign a contract to anything, you're giving your heart and soul to it. So Northampton, I love them, everything, I didn't want to leave, but they're gone now. Chesterfield is like, that's where my heart and soul lies. Mm. But, doesn't mean I still don't like love the people in Northampton. I yeah. always want what I'm there. The thing is, because all my friends are there, 
I'm there all the time. So I find myself watching loads of games. And that is the, Northampton is the one club that I'm closest to because I've got the biggest connection with everyone there, all the staff, the things I did, captain the club for ages. I played 108 concept, just everything that I did there. But as I say, like the underlying message for me is as I say, it's not it's not all about how talented you have to be. There's other ways people miles more talented than me, but they just don't have my dedication, they don't have my professionalism, they don't have my belief to so that you're gonna be that you're good enough to play, that you should be playing, that you will play. And like I say now, when I'm doing all this running now and stuff like that, I'm thirty four. The young lads can just maybe turn up on pre season as we talked about earlier in the in the broadcast and they might turn up and just run away from me. But in my head, when I'm running, I'm thinking, they're not going to beat me, they're not going to beat me, they're not going to beat me. <laughs> so it just gives them to something to keep chasing and thinking, well, if he's 34 and he's played 600 games and he's like doing this, this and this, and he's and he's still out every day running this sort of mouth, then you know they might be sat at home on their asses and they might just think, well, I need to start doing something. And that's all I want. If you just take one, if it just clicks into one person to think, you know, I'm actually talented. And then when you get the best players at the top, when you're talented and you do all the work as well, you know, you've, you hit the jackpot. It's a great motto, isn't it? Hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. And that's yeah. why you are, that's one of the reasons why you're such a fan favourite because they know that you always give ahead 110% every week and you'll work hard to keep your place. And that's all they ask. Yeah, I think that's what it is. When I go out there, when I represent a football club, when I go out there, you know, just saying, you know, you rep forget about the name on the back, you're representing the badge that's on the front. And I think you can't always play well. I mean, I, the amount of shit I've had off every club that I've been off, at every club, I've had run-ins with supporters at every single club, but that's just part and parcel of it, you know. But I can accept criticism and that's why I'm one of the players who will be on social media, win, lose or draw, and I'll say what I think and I'll get myself into discussions and arguments with fans. But I think it's important that you interact with fans, not just when you're winning, because it's easy to do that. But fans are entitled to the opinion, they pay the money to go and watch the game. Everybody sees the game differently, that's why we love the game of football, you know. And that's why everyone plays it differently. Or everybody wants to be a striker, or not everybody wants to be a goalkeeper, or whatever it is. We all see it differently. But I can accept criticism to say you were shit today, or you shouldn't be in the team, you're not better than. I can accept that. Only thing I've never accepted is personal abuse, because I just don't think anybody is entitled to do that. You know, I can tell you you're not good at your job. I don't think you're a good journalist or whatever, but I can't personally abuse you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just my opinion. So that's when I sometimes I come unstuck on social media when it when people get personal and they think they can get away with it because they're behind the keyboard. So obviously last year your four year spell with Northampton came to an came to an end as you yeah. like you say you there you joined National League side Chesterfield. Just how quickly did you settle into the side after playing league football for so long? Yeah, I settled in really quickly. Uh, I knew one of the lads came to Chesterfield with me from Northampton goalkeeper young goalkeeper Luke Collington he came with me uh, I knew a couple of lads obviously playing against them in the league that were there so I settled in really well and I think when you're an experienced player as I say it's a lot easier when people already know you and who you've played for and they've played against you you know they've already done as footballers it's just natural you do your homework on people you know but uh, I don't want to be accepted by anybody if you're in a new environment it's like going to a new school you know you still get them nerves uh you've just got to make sure that when you get onto the training ground that when the games start and when the competitive football starts and it's me against you then that's when you, you earn your respect then as a player when people think oh yeah 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 he's, he's good for us him you know we want him on our side and I settled in really quickly, really. But as I say, we, we got off to a ter terrible, terrible start. So as we were talking off air before, I mentioned that you've um, you've got a degree in sports journalism. Just just give us a little insight about how how that developed. 
Yeah, so the order I've got, obviously, I think it's important. It gets to a thing where you think, what do I want to do? Well, I obviously want to stay in football. That's where I want to be. I want to, mm. if I've played that long in the game, you know, I think I've got a lot of knowledge and a lot of, I think I'd be good, you know, in the environment of coaching and managing people. But, you know, it's difficult to get into. So I do want to stay in the game, so I do my badges. But in the meantime, I wanted to get educated. Uh, I wanted to, I wanted to keep my mind, you know, learning and go out of my comfort zone. So I did a degree in sports journalism, as I say, in, in sports journalism, broadcasting, uh, Staffs University. And that was difficult, especially when you're, when you're playing football full time, you're doing a part time degree, plus you're a dad, you know, you've got to run a family. It, it, people think footballers, yeah, we, we, we don't work nine till five but you know mentally and physically it's draining and to, to do a degree on the side of it was difficult but I enjoyed it I really enjoyed it uh, and as I said I do I would like to do a lot in journalism if I can but it's just a, such a difficult industry as you know yourself mm. to make it to the top I mean I've been in the game and got connections and I've worked for the radio but I've sent emails to BT, I've sent emails to Sky Sports, I've sent emails to Quest TV just to try and get an opportunity to to even, you know, when they go live around the grounds and stuff like that, to be a reporter. Yeah. And you don't even get an email back. So, you know, for the port, for the undergrads, people are doing it full time. You know, I find it impossible. And it's good that you're doing it. Like, I think podcasts and things like that now are a massive part of that. That's the way I think people are going forward. But yeah, I really enjoy my degree and I got a first as well. So there was only two of us got a first. I got a wow. first. So yeah, I was, I'm, I'm like degree, as you say, it's weird, but that's another thing that um, I'm really proud of. Really, it's got nothing to do with football, but to study for it and, you know, what I learned while doing it and to go and do it, it even if I don't, want to be a journalist or a sports journalist should I say I can use my degree for loads of things uh, but just to be on your CV you know is it's brilliant because I've gone and re-educated myself uh, obviously while I've been in a high demanding job so I think a lot of employees and stuff like that will look at that massively in your favour yeah, it's such a hard industry because there's so many people doing the same thing. You, you, you've you just got to keep regularly pushing your content on there and advertising your work the best you can. And uh, just obviously be as professional as you can and, and just push it out there and I'm sure many doors will open for you. Yeah, I think I think you've got to. You know, you've got the time and, and like you said, the patience and the love. And the love, you've got to have love for everything that you do. Yeah. To be a top journalist, you've got, you've got to have the love. And if you're like you say now, you're getting interviews with myself and other sports mm. people, and you're getting it out there, you've, you've got to make sure you get it. It's people want about social media, but is it good or is it bad? But it's the freest advertisement in the world. You, everybody knows that. You know, if you if you can you can put something on social media, it takes one person who's a superstar. If if David Beckham retweets it or comments on it, all of a sudden you're going yeah. viral, aren't you? And it's the same. I mean, my my kids. <laughs> away from like football but on the journalism side my kids all they do is watch youtube videos and these young people doing opening kinder eggs and stuff like that <laughs> yeah, but these videos have got 31 million views yeah and stuff like that and then you look deeper into it and they're, they're earning ridiculous ridiculous money millions and millions and millions of pounds but i think with journalism i'm just being you just keep knocking on people's doors but i just think if your face fits you, you need somebody to i think you need somebody to open a door for you in in yeah in you know especially if you want to be a broadcaster on sky bt bbc you know if you want to even the radios talk sport you know it's it's all biased when you listen to talk sport i'm not just saying it but every presenter and every people on it they're all from london they're all southern mm -hmm people except obviously Alan McCoy is Scottish but that's just the way it is and then you I mean I I did 
the course with some people that are on Sky Sports now. Curtis Davis was on my Curtis Davis was on my course, and you know Graham Stark and Alex Scott. She's done it. Who, who I think is fantastic. She's doing. But then I see the like I see other people on there who are just getting the opportunity because they play in the Premier League or they've played in the World Cup or you know, and I listen to you must see it yourself, you listen to reporting on games and they don't even know people's names who they're reporting on or they don't know the ins and outs of the game. So that's what I'm saying is if people have gone out like yourself, me or whatever, you're getting educated and you can't get a job. But if you really want to do it, you can do anything you want. If you keep knocking yeah. doors down. I've got no doubt about it. if I if I really wanted to be a sports journalist and get into it, I'd make sure I did everything I could to get to the top or get to trying to the top and you know because i i wouldn't take no for an answer until i got some sort of interview or some sort of opportunity so before we do call day david uh, using any formation could you sort of name for us your dream 11 using players that you've played with throughout your career when i got this message before you started i thought oh no uh, <laughs> because i didn't have time to think but there's so many p players that i could pick and you know when when you do the one thing is when you do this dream eleven people always go oh well you played with him and I've I've mentioned a few people I've played with but you know I think you've got to go with for what they contributed at the time to your football club you know because you can't pick everyone so I'd pick Casper Schmeichel in that because when I was at Bury at the time he came in on loan as a young keeper from City and that was the first time I'd seen a goalkeeper. I mean, forget what he's done now. He's a world class keeper, but he just knew he was going to be world class. He had the he had the weight of the dad of how good his dad was on his shoulders. But he just came in and he was just unbelievable. But he just wanted to be a keeper. He would like usually striker saying to the managers and the coaches, "Can we do a shooting session?" Casper be like, "Can we do a shooting session?" And he'd be bantering the keepers or bantering the strikers that they missed and saying the shit and. Any chance of hitting the target? He, he was this type of character, so I'd, I'd, I'd have to go with Casper in that. Uh, but obviously, I've played with a lot of good, a lot of good keepers, a lot of friends <laughs> of goalkeepers as well, and that that's a big thing when I did this because a lot of uh, good friends of keepers. But I'll go for Casper Schmeichel in that. Uh, I'd have to say Brendan Maloney at right back. Was it? He was in the team at Northampton when we won the league. Uh, Brendan was brilliant; could do everything up and down the pitch. Uh, just a real good fullback, and you know, we had a great relationship. Me and Brendan, obviously, with the two two other people that are going to play as well. But I'd, I'd have Brendan Maloney at right back. Uh, I'm going to get my phone. I'd have uh, Tom Tom Clark at centre back alongside Bailey Wright. They were the they were the centre half pairing when I was at Preston. Uh, Clark is captain still there now at Preston. That tells you how well he's done. Uh, Bailey Wright is actually at Bristol City, but he went on loan to Sunderland, I think. I don't know if he signed for Sunderland permanently. But them two that season, and Paul Huntington, to be fair, was unbelievable. Clark, he would, if you wanted anybody in the team, he would to go and put his head through a wall. He, he was the guy, you know, just a leader. Total, them two together, just total rock, so... I'd say them, but I'm going to have to get my phone out now. I think the left-back selection would be interested. <laughs> the left-back, yeah. I had a few I had a few left-back selection in mind just for people that have played like internationally, Johnny Evans, Craig Cathcart, things like that. Uh, obviously, Craig Dawson, who just lives down the road for me as well, was at Rochdale and stuff. But I'm going to go for Tom Kennedy. Uh, TK. He's a good friend of mine, TK, but... When I was at Bury, TK was a year older than me, and he broke into the first team before me. And he was before, like he was playing in front of me, uh, in the in the first team. And when I got into the first team, I would like people don't realise I was like playing midfield for the first four or five years of my career. Mm. Uh, and TK was playing at left back, so Tom were brilliant. I learned loads just watching him all the time. You know, left foot like a wand. Just could do everything really and he had a great career he went to leicester barnsley rochdale filed uh obviously bury so i'd have tk in at left back uh 
midfield. I, this was <laughs> this was really difficult for me. Uh, but I had to go for when I played with them. So I went for Welsh, and I went for Welsh and Paul Gallagher. I had to get Gallagher in my team somewhere just because mm. he's probably the best player that I've played with Fantastic in terms of player. what he can do with the football and the way his brain works. He's still doing it now. So uh, Welsh and Gallagher, I would have in the centre of midfield and then I'd have Nicky on the left in front of me, Nicky Adams on the left in front of me and I'd have Ricky Holmes on the right in front of Brendan Maloney. Uh, Nicky we spoke about already. Ricky Holmes, yeah. along with Gallagher individually, one of the best players I've ever played with. The goals he scored the best goals I've ever seen. But Ricky was one of them. Uh schoolful could do everything, but just knew how good he was. You know, he had that arrogance. Sometimes people that hate Ricky because it like go over the top, but he just knew I were the best. If he didn't play any score, he'd come on and score a volley and he'd run over to Wilder with his hands up and saying, Don't leave me out again. <laughs> That's just a type of person he was. Anyway. And eventually, Chris ended up signing him for Sheffield United. Uh, but he suffered a lot with his back, Rick. But unbelievable player. I'd love to see him get fit and well again. And it'd be good to see him back in the Northampton shirt. I'd love them to try and get him, if I'm being honest. Uh, or maybe if I'm managing in a couple of years, I'll, I'll, I'll go and sign him. <laughs> uh, and then up top, I went for this was again. I could have had a few for this, but. I went for a big and a little one. So I went for Mark Richards, who was a skipper at centre forward at Northampton. Rico could do everything again. Uh, just brilliant leader, held the ball up, scored goals, you know, aggressive. And then next to him, I'd have Joe Garner. Garner was just everything you needed, you know, scored goals in big games, upset defenders, got in your face. Trained brilliantly, brilliant around the dressing room. Yeah, so it'd be me 11 would be Schmeichel, Maloney, Clark, Wright, Tom Kennedy, Welsh, Holmes, Gallagher, and Adams, Richards, and Garner. And then can I name a bench as well? Yeah, of course you can, yeah. So if I were having seven subs, I'd have Stephen Dawson, who's my best mate. He was he was unbelievable when I was at, at Bury with him, really, really, really drove our, our team forward. Uh, Elliot Bennett, again, great had a player. Great career, captain of uh, Blackburn, had a great career. Brilliant when he came to us as a young lad. You know, set the world light, but his dedication was class. Uh, Dominic Calvert Lewin, people are probably there. Is he not in your team now when he's still doing it at Everton? But he came as a young lad from Sheffield United to Northampton and done brilliant. You know, he's he's gone on to do better than I think anyone ever thought he would, even though he had all the attributes and. I think he could go straight. I think he could go right to the top. I think one of the big clubs might buy him in, in, in a couple of years. Paul Huntington has to make my team just for the character, personality, player, just everything about Hunts. You know, there's nothing you couldn't like about him. He's a model professional. Everyone should look up to the to what he's done in his career, and you won't go far wrong. Uh, Keith Keane, another one. Keane always at Preston. For Preston fans, Keane was like Mr. Reliable. Could play anywhere. You could play him centre half, centre midfield, right back. You know, he'd do a job for you anywhere, Keane So Keane and Alan Brown, who's a captain as well. Club, he, he, he's playing international for Republic of Ireland. He came to Preston when I was there as a young lad on trial. And when he first came on trial, everyone was like, Who's this guy? Oh, he ain't good enough. And then he just worked and worked and fit and he just you could just see him and Josh Brown lose at Burnley now. They just progressed and progressed and progressed. And like when I see him play now, I go to Preston games, you know. It's just an engine room in the midfield and scores massive goals. So hope he goes on right to the top. And obviously I could not have an leave without having Andy Bishop. They should have to be involved in the bench. Uh I'm lucky not to start, but I know Bishop involved all day, scored, scored some unbelievable goals. Uh, and it's great to see Bish, what he's doing now for Barino. You know, he's, he's, he's involved in the Phoenix club and all that in a massive way. And it's a bit, Bish reminds me a bit like myself with Northampton, 
you know, he's not from Bury area at all, but he's sort of been adopted by the Bury fans and the people of Bury. You know, he, he lives in the Bolton or Bury area still, and you know they just treat him as they treat him as one of one of their own because of the things he's done or continues to do on and off the pitch. So it wouldn't surprise me as well if if he probably was one of the first managers of that team. So David, it's been fantastic speaking to you today. We've had a lot of fun there, a lot of memories rekindled. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's been absolutely fantastic, mate. No worries. Thank you. Take care. If you need me again. Oh, you too. Will do, pal. Cheers. <laughs>